everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Rikhi, board member of KPMG Dubai, ex CEO of KPMG India. I'm chairing this session, which is rebuilding trust in institutions post COVID 19. Uh, I would like to introduce um, the esteemed panel members uh, who are joining with joining me on this important discussion. We have Dr. John Blakey, who is the founder of the of the Trusted Executive Foundation, a leadership development organization whose mission is to create a new standard of leadership defined by trustworthiness. John is the author of the best-selling book, The Trusted Executive, which captures his prize-winning uh, research to create the nine habits of trust at Aston Business School and was shortlisted as the Chartered Management Institute Book of the Year in 2017. Uh, we have uh, uh, Terence Mori, who uh, is hopefully will join us soon, is the founder of Future Hack Future Lab, a global think tank and a junk professor at MIT. Uh, we also have uh, Phil O'Reilly, O'Reilly is the director of Iron Duke Partners, a Wellington-based public ad uh, policy advisory firm. He's the chair of the board of the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD and a member of the governing body of the International Labour Organization. He's also a board member of various uh, global and uh, New Zealand-based companies. He was previously the chief executive of Business New Zealand. The next uh, panel member is Devin Narang who is the Managing Director of Syndectum's uh, Renewable Energy Business in India. He has over 36 years of experience uh, with demonstrated history of working in the renewable and environment industry and is a strong business development profession. Devin's family belongs to one of the oldest and most reputed industrial families of India, the Naran family. Last but not the least, we have Sean Nell who is the founder and chairman of the Indian Chamber of Commerce US, a global organization bringing strategic relationships, market knowledge, engages business and investment initiatives to develop partnerships that result in establishing business-to-business -business partnerships and business-to-government uh, partnerships. Uh, so the way we'll run this session is that uh, I will just have a few opening comments and then I will uh, ask questions from the different panel members. Uh, because it is their session and I'll just give a few opening comments before we start. So trust, the very fundamentals on which trust in any democracy is built is transparency, developments of procedures and protocols, credibility, proactivity, putting the public first, uh, collaborating with stakeholders, consistency, and of course, educating the stakeholders and the public and keeping promises that were made. Trust is also a key part of messaging, decision-making, and action for a smooth functioning of any institution, especially during a crisis period, which we are talking about today. As the world grapples with a new set of pandemic-related unknowns, the public trust of government institutions was lost. And uh, this has created a lot of issues amongst, and there are different views on it. Of course, some people don't believe so much, but uh, they believe, uh, many people believe the trust levels have fallen. Be it governments or their parallel bodies, financial institutions, health departments, their ability to cope with the challenges of the pandemic was questioned. Income equality has significantly increased in both advanced economies and emerging markets. Wealthy countries have had the means to intervene early to protect people and business by pumping more than $9.8 trillion into their economies. But low and income countries have not been able to do the same. The failure of richer countries to supply vaccines and financial support to the world poorer countries further reduced trust of the poorer countries in the fairness of the inter international system. What will it take to rebuild trust or preferably given that declining trust is an issue that long predates the pandemic to build trust back better? Rebuilding trust in government is imperative for government to deliver on their various missions such as policy making, regulating markets and enforcing rules and compliance and protecting citizens. Uh, with these few words, um, um, I will now uh, 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 go to my panel and ask. So, John, can I ask you the first question? Uh, yeah. What is trust building agenda? Why is trust building agenda so critical post pandemic? And what are the behaviors that inspire trust? Thank you, Richard, and uh, yeah, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, where, where, wherever wherever you are in the world, and uh, great to be with uh, my fellow panel members having this conversation because very passionate about this this topic. Um, 
I'm a great believer that what the world needs right now are leaders who rely on the power of trust rather than leaders who trust in power. Um, we, we thought we were here talking about one crisis, but we're one global crisis. We're probably talking about several global crises. Um, and I think that's the, the real reason why we need to focus on trust now is that um, my own book, Trust the Executive, was published in 2016. We were still um, seeing trends then that meant that trust was becoming a boardroom agenda item because we were seeing trends around um, uh, technology, around diversity and inclusion, around globalization. Uh, we were seeing trends that were already um, putting pressure on trust in institutional life and, and various surveys, notably the, the Edelman Global Trust Barometer has, has been alerting us of the, the, the problems that we've had in different parts of the world with trust pre-COVID. But I think what happens when you have a period of crisis is it, 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 it turbocharges some of those trends. And the last two years, I think, uh, have turbocharged a process that, that was already happening that, that I would summarize as a shift between from, from what I would call the industrial age to the social age. And in the industrial age, power and authority uh, was sufficient to hold it all together. But I think in the social age, Power and authority is an insufficient uh, currency to to hold our institutions together. And trust is the only currency that we know that has the power to do that. But equally, we are in that shift in time where there are still leaders who are relying upon power. Um, and there are those that want to, to move towards a trust-based uh, relationship. And I think that creates a huge amount of tension, as we can see, right now in terms of what, what behaviors inspire trust the research says that um, there are three pillars of trust uh, ability integrity and benevolence that a trusted brand or a trusted leader will be competent at what they do so they they have that ability they will be they will have their ethics and their values in terms of their integrity but they will also have this thing called benevolence this this wishing well for others this this sort of human care, compassion, kindness, that this is part of the trust formula. And my own work with the nine habits model is to, to take those three pillars and convert them into behavioral habits. So three habits under each pillar, which I won't go into just, just now uh, for the sake of brevity. But, um, but yeah, that, that hopefully, Richard, that gives us a little starting point, you know, in terms of where we are, why it's important and, and how we might inspire trust as, as leaders and institutions. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, three nice words I've listened to now. Ability, integrity, benevolence. I never attached benevolence actually to trust. But today, the way you have put it across, compassion, I know is a big thing which came out during post-COVID. And uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, we would have loved to listen to more on it because uh, it's something new, at least to me. Uh, Phil, may I come to you now? Uh, Phil, uh, New Zealand, as we have seen uh, across the world, we all <coughs> complimented your prime minister for the wonderful work she did as pandemic broke out. So uh, how do you see as a New Zealander sitting in the midst of this whole thing that uh, how did the institutions in New Zealand actually react to this crisis? Well, thanks, Richard. I hope you can, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Great to see you yeah. here from uh, Wellington, uh, New Zealand, a, a, a a lovely uh, a late summer evening at one thirty in the morning. Great to be here. Um, uh, well, th and, and you're right, Richard. Of course, New Zealand was a was a global beacon, if you like, of of trust at the at the start of the pandemic, nearly two years ago. Uh, and and uh, that was based on some interesting uh, thoughts. Really, firstly, what we did was relatively simple. It wasn't simple, but it was relatively simple. If you've ever flown to New Zealand. You know, you spend a long time over water before you get here, and uh, so it, we were isolated, and so we could actually have some quite radical things like stopping people coming, including New Zealanders crossing the border, a human rights catastrophe at one level, but also saved many, many lives on the other. Uh, and we already had very, very high trust in institutions in New Zealand. You know, we're, we're commonly number one or number two on the uh, perceptions, global perceptions uh, of lack of corruption around the world, and that's true. In New Zealand, there's high trust in institutions. And so because the message at the start of the pandemic was very, very clear, go home, stay lives, we're going to close the border, uh, and 
we had an elimination strategy. It was all very well understood by the public. There was no alternative. And because we're a wealthy country, when they said go home and stay alive, there was a home to go to. We none of none of us particularly live on the street. So so in that sense it was it was simple. And and that played out also in the way that vaccines rolled out. We're currently ninety six percent, I think, ninety six percent double vaxxed across the eligible population and 77% treble vaxxed across the population. So at that level, went really, really well. And I'd love to tell you, trust in institutions was raised and we're all good and we're a model for the world. Actually, that's not quite right. What's now happened is that is that, that trust has started to wane. And the reason is that things have become rather more complicated in New Zealand. Now we are all vaxxed, but we still can't go to a football match. I still can't turn up to see a football match. I've still got gathering limits of 100 because we're just starting to go through the Omicron wave. We're in the middle of the Omicron wave that everybody else has already gone through. And there's increasingly a feeling amongst the public in New Zealand that perhaps the government has overreached with its restrictions and has been too, uh, has been too uh, conservative about the way it's gone about things. Now, not everybody thinks that, but a significant number do. In fact, we had about a 1,000 protesters camping on the grounds of the parliament until yesterday or the day before protesting some of those measures. So in my, in my sense now, New Zealand is quite split apart uh, right now over this matter. And, and that's unusual for me as a New Zealander. Normally, New Zealand is a much more together sort of a place. It's the nature of our culture. So what's caused that? Well, if, if you look at uh, the things you need to be careful of, I think even in a, in a high trust uh, place like New Zealand, our, our health officials in particular centralised far too much. And that's now playing out because it turns out bureaucrats are pretty awful at getting things done, as we all know. And so, for example, just until a few weeks ago, you couldn't buy a rapid antigen test in New Zealand. You couldn't do it. The Ministry of Health had banned them. In fact, if you came across the border with a rapid antigen test, that would have been taken off you, would have been confiscated from you. So that's, that, that's the kind of centralised control we had of things like testing. And only now, in fact, only just today, I got my first set of rapid antigen tests at home. Uh, so so the, the government overreached, if you like, public control. They said, we don't like these rats and we're going to control them, causing a lack of, of, of public faith. Second concern that actually started to play out was the far too much centralisation of the message. One, our, our Prime Minister, actually one of, well, one of the key ministers around COVID about a year ago on a daily 1pm press conference said, this place, when we talk, it's the only truth you'll hear. This is, this is the truth here, which sounds rather Marxist, doesn't it? Sounds rather kind of weird when you think about that. And so we lost the point about plurality in the debate. We were far too interested in in one version of the truth, and we weren't brave enough uh, for the last couple of years to have several versions of the truth. And what that leads to, of course, is a bunch of people not believing and a bunch of people rushing off into the netherworld of the internet and deciding that they're going to believe the latest rumor on the internet. So this desire to have only one voice and the control of the message was, 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 it was damaging in the end to us. The, se- the third point was it turns out, and this is the nature of, this is the nature of uh, bureaucracies, it turns out that some of the things the government did were wrong, illegal, uh, and misleading. Uh, now, all governments do that. It's not a particular criticism of my own, but nevertheless, it was. And because, they, because they'd set themselves up as being the only source of truth, when it turns out that some of the things they did were misleading and wrong, and, and they, they don't want to admit that, it turns out that that's quite damaging and quite corrosive. And the last thing that's, the last thing that's going on in terms of, of trust in institutions now and its challenges is that there's a feeling amongst m- many people in New Zealand that the controls that we're now seeing in New Zealand are disproportionate to the public health issues. And so, you know, the fact that I can't turn up to a football game, even though we're 96% double vexed, is one of those things where people say, really, are you sure that's now proportional to what we need? So the lesson for us all here about trust in institutions, and by the way, trust in institutions remains stratospherically high in New Zealand, no problem with that, but we need to be cautious about taking that for granted. We need to make sure that controls are proportionate, that they're timely, that we allow other voices in the debate throughout to make sure that, uh, that, that our democratic institutions are challenged. And we need to make sure that when things change, our democratic institutions change with them. And I think we're a lesson in how to start well and finish badly when it comes to COVID. Thanks, Richard. Richard, you're on mute. Richard, you're on mute. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Phil, uh, <clears throat> that was really good. Uh, I think you gave a very good summary. I didn't know the second part of it, actually. We all heard of the first part, and the second part has been news to us. But I like some of the points you raised. Uh, controls being disproportionate, uh, not being timely enough, 
change when you need to change and also make sure that you're not too centralized over centralized uh, when doing something and uh, and allow the plurality of the debate to take place others people will go to whatsapp and they will go to social media and find uh, other means and those could be complete rumors also but thank you very much for sharing it and for being so open and frank in your uh, discussions uh, devin i would like to come to you now uh, post any crisis how do you expect uh, institutions which are there uh, uh, to help build the trust back in uh, in themselves and are there any examples that you would like to share with the audience yeah thanks richard i think uh, the topic for today should have been uh, not post covid because i think covid has been forgotten in the past 8 days it's post russia and ukraine would have been a more appropriate top- topic but having said that i think richard couple of things which worked well uh, during covid uh, at least in india and you must remember that uh, all indians believe in destiny and uh, memories are very short lived you know uh, so as far as india is concerned currently as we speak people have forgotten what happened last year or year before last uh, there are major elections in couple of states public memory is very short uh, economy is doing very well so people are more interested in counting rupees and probably the memories have faded except for those who lost very close relatives or very close family members and they can't forget what happened uh, last year but establishing trust a couple of things which i felt uh, uh, happened correctly or happened rightly in india was really the very effective communication and helplines which are set up in india which actually saw businesses and people could get uh, you know access to them and try at least there was somebody to help you out or a voice at the end of the call so i think in any post crisis situation uh, communication is important uh, how the economy is doing is important and how people's livelihoods uh, how you bring the livelihoods of people who lost especially people who are on daily wages uh in in india uh they managed to actually come back the biggest factor also has been corporates the corporate sector worked very well established through the csr activities made sure and ngos came forward and help people who had lost jobs so i think uh, uh you know uh, uh instead of the press uh, everything became very sensationalized during covid i think that uh, pitch uh, that high pitch has gone low now uh government has uh, at least in india government has done lot a lot by building infrastructure and thereby giving a lot of jobs to people and just fueling the economy with um, massive announcement of infrastructure projects especially roads in india which have uh, been highly successful so i think post covid uh as law as far as this economy is concerned it's bouncing back uh, except for this crisis and i don't know the past 8 9 days what it evolves uh, what it leads to with oil prices high and uh, you know we are again probably getting into a crisis mode for which at least i am not qualified to comment what is going to happen because um, one really doesn't know i'll pause now <clears throat> thank you devin um, i think uh, talking about infrastructure i think that was a good point you raised that the government of india spent and i know they've done a lot on the road side especially tolling these roads sending giving uh, you know and some really large corp- uh, global companies have bought into it uh, shawn may i come to you now you are living in the us and uh, us being the largest economy and uh, anything happening there impacts the rest of the world was there any change in people perception towards the government and other institution as far as trust is concerned thank you richard and thank you and morning to all panel members as well as the team members who's watching uh richard this is this is definitely a very important question um uh, trust and perception it goes hand in hand pretty much and uh, we have seen as far as us is concerned initially before the outbreak we had a challenge about immediately after the the democratic voting 
and what happened i'm sure everybody is aware of, aware of what's going on what was going on but as it started the covid took over and then we had a situation where the elections happened and there was a lot of uh, upfront being here okay, maybe the new government would take care of it and things like that so there was a lot of expectations and uh, uh, as a result i'm not really sure whether there was a breakdown in the communication that happened but initially the entire united states was beginning to be at the outbreak was coming together and there were a lot of trust with the government but eventually we started a lot of split happening and there's a different thoughts going on various topics has been brought up there was a, the main divide was the political divide however and that political divide really it stretched the limits of the pharmacy industry the healthcare industry the media had took advantage of this probably and that is the key driver here and as a result the people on the ground started facing a lot of music and people were started not very confident who to listen to is the cdc right or is the nih right is the white house right or is it the a media right who is right the city's figures would always tell you a different story versus the cdc story will be much different so we really never had a, a good creative dashboard even though we say that us is one of the uh, technology oriented states but where is the we have seen an absence of technology coordination or collaboration that is taking place and that is all going on as we speak it is much better but there is a different stages of uh, pandemic that happened we have seen significant changes there things are much better now we don't see too much of uh, we don't hear much but that does not mean that the cases is not there take for instance in new york right now we have already crossed we are closing in about 5 million people in cases and about 68000 plus people dead so there is a significant impact which has taken in the last two years time if you look at it uh, so how that has been handled is a different story maybe it'll all come out in the books after four or five years as to who handled what and things like that. but as of now it's a it's a it's a state where differences of opinion rights the current status is so you ask person they will tell you about their own status they have no knowledge about what's happening with the other group uh, because we don't have a a uh, cohesive or a collaborative format where we can derive this information to me this is driving the perception in the market and this is why you know whether the political field is taking advantage of it the democrats wants to blame the republicans the republicans want to put it on the democrats but generally the people are not in a position to do anything much and they all talk to the congress congress themselves are coming up with their own versions and therefore the people are or uh, sometimes i really wonder that maybe the constitution should have given us an opportunity where you could actually get the just like a corporate companies the executives is not uh, they if you see a non performance you get that ex out and bring in a new one so can we do that for the congress i'm not really sure but uh, bottom line is that i think this is where it has to come to and there should be some sort of change um the way i look at it white house or the cdc is so all the information is good but to me it is a clear uh, scenario where we are seeing an imbalance in the trust factor it's a clear imbalance in the trust factors people don't know uh, there are a lot of management words being used there are a lot of pandemic words being used and uh, but the accuracy of the status cannot be guaranteed by anybody therefore the trust is uh, dwindling around the people and uh, the perceptions keeps on changing to who you are really asked so i uh, let me stop at that richard thank you thank you um, i think very good perception and trust and uh, a lot of political divide uh, a lot of it uh, we can see it depends which news channel you listen to you would get the, the news according to that and uh, also who is right uh, is a confusion which is in all countries actually john i mean if you right. look at it uh, uh, i think it's the narrative which actually gets uh, played out uh, but you know us being the world leader and uh, uh, people look up to us for a lot of things and uh, i know you all have gone through your fair share of inflation also post this covid right. and uh, and uh, seeing it at an all time high kind of uh, phil may i come to you now uh, 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 we normally react or have views on what institutions do we all you know citizens do that 
uh, what do you how do you, uh, uh, what do you think about the relationship between institution and the citizens in terms of our rights and responsibilities what's the concern? well thanks uh, and just just maybe answer that question in terms of covid i mean in in a broad sense of course in new yes. zealand uh, we generally have high quality institutions that are um we're free of corruption, of course, and you know, in dealing, I deal with those institutions every day. It's my job, uh, and as a general rule, they they try quite hard to to do what they're supposed to do, and they try quite hard to to have good public policy outcomes through process and and consultation and all the rest that we'd be familiar with. But during COVID, I think we learned some lessons about not being lazy about that. <clears throat> so, one of the big lessons I think was that. We saw quite a bit of institutional overreach, and I think this is probably true in a number of countries where you saw institutions starting to decide how we could live our lives. And in one sense, that was entirely appropriate because we were in unprecedented times. But I, you know, my sense was some some institutions in New Zealand, certainly some actors in those institutions, started to think that that was some sort of new normal. That this wasn't an unusual sort of situation, and you would have seen that in a number of countries where you saw this rather institutional overreach. And that's uh, and, and so the lesson we need to learn is that. Institutions are for us; they're not. We're not for them, uh, and that was particularly the case with regard to public health. The second thing we learned in New Zealand, at least, and I suspect elsewhere, was that when it comes to crisis time, you can't just listen to one voice. In New Zealand, our, our uh, reaction and much of the debate was led by our Ministry of Health. Now, that's entirely appropriate, of course, but the Ministry of Health knows very little about the business community. They understand very little about uh, the role of competition and regulation in other areas of the economy. And they, it was impossible for them, not their fault, but it was impossible for them to balance off the health uh, uh, reaction, or health response with the economic response and so on. That was government's job, of course, and government did a very poor job of that, still does today. Uh, so what you saw, because you saw one, one institution taking most of the voice, that led to an imbalanced public policy outcomes. So the lesson we learned in New Zealand was if you do, well, certainly I learned, was that if you're going to do this in the future, you need to put together a group of institutions and have a lot of different advice, both publicly uh, and, and and privately, to make sure that governments take, take a balanced view, or in our case, it was a rather uh, imbalanced view. And the last point I'd make uh, is that leads to proportionality. So what we did, what happened in New Zealand, arguably, at the start, I don't think there was an argument, we pulled the health lever very hard and in fact, our government, they, they, they're fond of saying they follow the health advice. Actually, they don't. They're more conservative than the health advice. That's consistently the situation. So there was no, there was no, uh, that we pulled that health lever very hard because of that situation. And we didn't necessarily have a balanced view and ordered the government. And that's now playing out, as I say. We're now still closed as an economy. Only just in the last couple of days have New Zealanders been able to return home freely to New Zealand after two years. Now, that's a catastrophe human rights, in human rights terms. Uh, and that's a rather imbalanced situation. So there's some lessons out of this, I think, even in a well-run uh, society like New Zealand, relatively well-run, that th these kind of pressures, when they come on institutions, we need to go back and really stress test them and have people sitting on those institutions and politicians and others who are, who are conscious of the broad range of history and don't just say, gosh, we're going to do this thing today. We, we need to understand where we come from why we're a democracy and th those other balancing factors. And, and really, that was a bit lacking and still is uh, in the New Zealand response. So I think some relatively good lessons to learn, not just for New Zealand, but for others, because most people would look at New Zealand and say, gee, that's a country that runs public policy pretty well, and still we stumbled. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot uh, there. Uh, and I think the, the important point is uh, one should not uh, it is the right ministries. Actually, the ministries needed to come together. Like in most countries, they did not. And I think this is one big uh, lesson I think countries have learned now, how you can have a more cohesive way of trying to deal with the situation. I think as uh, visitors, we still cannot visit New Zealand, right? I heard right. it's closed till October. No, so that's right. uh, visitor, uh, well, visitor. Government, that's another classic example, actually, Richard. The government's saying it's October, but we'll make it earlier. Okay. Well, okay, when? <laughs> and, so, and so the tourism sector, our biggest single export sector is going, uh, when can we start business? And it, that's a classic demonstration of the fact that we're not having the right business voices in the debate. Go government could tell us now what they, what they seek and what the, what the conditionality is about opening the border. They just don't want to say because it's, they're pu pulling far too hard on the health lever as a single lever. I'm not suggesting they shouldn't pull hard on it, but 
it's a single lever. That's absolutely right. And it causes that, exactly those kinds of stress points. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Devin, can I come to you next? Uh, during the pandemic, what are the new, you spoke about the Indian economy bouncing back and the government taking so many efforts. So what are the new opportunities that have emerged in the economy and how do you help some of them are going to help a nation building going forward as we create the new normal as we say talk about? So Richard, that's an excellent question. Uh, the pandemic saw a lot of interesting things. For example, we saw social media becoming extremely popular to launch new businesses. For example, uh, there were kids, I can say age of 20 to 30, who, who had products which were very uh, localized to a particular area. But using Instagram as a marketing tool, they have today uh, developed businesses which are a couple of million dollars. I mean, it's incredible. Fintech. Uh, how people use uh, uh, technology to transfer funds. I mean, look at it, Richard. India has produced 22 unicorns in the last one year in the COVID period. Uh, one of our biggest giants, Reliance, the biggest private sector company, uh, I don't know, raised 10 or $15 billion uh, on their new geo platform uh, during pandemic. Uh, so this this has been an amazing journey uh, for entrepreneurs to come forward. And we have now seen uh, entrepreneurs entering segments which we thought were very closed. For example, new range of soft drinks were launched through uh, Instagram marketing. Uh, new brands came in, ice cream brands came in. Uh, you know, today, just to be selfish, my daughter's launched a brand four years ago. Today is the number one selling most expensive ice cream brand in the country. So, you know, things like this, and they have doubled that turnover year on year, uh, uh, despite the pandemic. So we had a lot of these uh, success stories which have come around and they got funded uh, uh, without, funded on Zoom calls, on, uh, you know, on VC calls like we are having today. So this has been an amazing journey. And actually this has helped entrepreneurs to increase the GDP of areas which never had any growth. For example, you had a remote area where a couple of women got together and they, they made pickles, for example. And those pickles fo found a national market through Amazon and um, Flipkart of the world. So it has actually helped to revive economies and people suddenly realize that they have a talent which can now become national because you don't need to be on television. And you don't need to have a huge uh, multi-million dollar budgets to advertise your products. You can do it much more efficiently, either through WhatsApp or through Instagram or Facebook, any of the other social platforms. So this has actually really helped and given confidence to the government. And now they have started uh, encouraging startups, giving them tax breaks. This is all a part of the COVID activity. And uh, this has been a very exciting journey for, uh, I, I must say, for entrepreneurs. And India is, as you are aware, a society of entrepreneurs. So, you know, the entrepreneurship has actually come, come ahead. And uh, people have, uh, you know, amazing, you know, people, uh, uh, Richard, I'll take 30 seconds more. I visited a company today, which for the past five years has been using AR, VR, to skill people at various oil platforms and pharmaceutical companies which are, which are not accessible. And today I spent an hour and a half with them and I, I was blown that what a small Indian company in the outskirts of in Noida, which is outskirts of Delhi, have developed a device where they, they are actually training people how to, um, you know, uh, on... Uh, environment issues on training on oil rigs on training in pharmaceutical companies and is no one's even heard of them and it's incredible uh, what they've done all through pandemic so this is really very encouraging how the entrepreneurship has actually come forward and it has actually helped government to give them grants and give them loans and uh, make a special category of loans which can be given to these startups of course the policy has to evolve. We have to be much more, we have, we have to be faster, but you have to also consider that we are a population of 1.4 billion. So, you know, it, it, it has its own challenges. Yeah. 
thank you, Devin. I think that was very good. I think uh, you were spot on. Uh, the startup community in India is booming. Uh, it is said that while China and US have many more uh, unicorns at the moment, but India is going to produce uh, many more going forward. And uh, like you rightly said, in this year itself, we've seen 22 unicorns uh, which have come. And we are seeing many more getting built, actually. Uh, I'm involved with the startup community, so one can see them. Um, and very nice compliments to your daughter uh, for the ice cream brand. And uh, it must be a proud moment for you as a father to see, you know, your child actually Absolutely. produce the most expensive ice cream brand in Absolutely. these times, you know, and uh, uh, very good. Excellent. Uh, but it was, a good, it was good stories you shared. And I think uh, this whole thing around uh, the... Just to share with everybody else in India on the fintech, India has the maximum number of digital transactions uh, anywhere in the world, even bigger than China. We have the largest number of digital transactions and the investment made on the digital platforms have been amazing in this country and it's connected rural and the urban together. And now we need to make it more effective, like David said. And we need to put more commerce through it. I think that's where the challenge is going to come. Uh, Richard, I'll uh, just add one more, the 10 seconds, maybe very sure, informative sure. for the audience to know sure. that people less than 30 in India are probably the second or the third biggest investors in cryptos in the world. Okay. And this is a properly documented report. So it is, and this has only happened if there was no COVID, this would not have happened. Because okay. all they're doing is sitting on the computer or the mobiles and doing this. So, you know, it's an I'm so excited. You cannot be in a better place at this moment. Uh, the, the, you know. Thank you, Devi. Uh, Sean, let me come to you. You are an Indian, but sitting in America at the heart of everything. And, uh, 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 you know, like uh, the nature of institutional trust, as you see it from the U.S. angle compared to other countries where you are doing business with. How do you see that uh, pan out, you know? the difference in the trust levels in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world from where you sit. Yeah, uh, Richard, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I think you alluded to it very clearly, generally the people perception is that you know, they all look towards U.S. to provide directions when in situations like this. And it was generally understood that U.S. would be taking the lead on all these initiatives, whether it is the vaccines, whether it is the mandate, so mass and all of those things. But maybe it is the absence of the leadership or maybe it's the proper framework was not put in place and yeah. uh, this could have led to the a absence of leadership from the us and as a result most of the countries out there who are looking towards us uh, got a mixed signal or a mixed message and each had to do on their own now take the case of india india is now becoming a case study because through that process india has actually developed a model in which they were able to take care of their own people. And uh, generally, we are only one third, of, uh, one third of the total population size of India. But still, you know, they have managed it so well. The mass mandates, whether it is the policies of how it would be institutionalized, as well as how the uh, vaccines would be coming and how it would be distributed. The entire distribution system, supply chain system within India has improved considerably. In US, we did not have that issues. But at the same time, we had challenges which has probably come from the, the thought processes of the constituents. And it all depends upon whether you are a Democrat or you are uh, you're Republican. So the political angle has actually influenced on how this come out. And the rest of the world took it very late in the game when they realized that there is too much of politics going on. So it is upon us to take this mantle and go forward for our country with it. The countries which were not in a position to do it, they would still come back because when U.S. itself is suffering, how can you actually advise the others? So the media took on their ownership of advising every country saying you should be doing this, you should be doing this, you should follow this, you should buy this vaccines. And the net result is the pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry really boomed and they made significant profits. So that's an upside. Uh, the grant and stimulus that was provided by the government you know, went into the pockets. A lot of things went to the good pockets, but uh, some got uh, corrupted and some became overnight uh, uh, news items, either if they were 
And so we saw those kind of challenges also come together. So these are mixed messages that is going out to the world. So the trust factors has eroded in many ways when, when you really look at it. And uh, there is a, by and large, there is a, uh, th there is a, uh, a backlash which has come because of that. And uh, the, the progress that was actually expected to happen has not happened so far. Uh, this is also one of the reasons why we, see, we have seen that inflation come and go kind of scenario. But generally, the, the people have started leaving jobs and setting up their own entrepreneurship. And they are doing much better in that scenario. So that also allows them uh, for not going to office, but they are able to comfortably work. The prices of the houses and the housing systems across the United States has started skyrocketing. We have also seen some uh, additional forum where you see the large corporations have actually moved out of the California region and moved to Texas, Arizona, Nevada, and other states. And here, there's a very important point. It tells me very clearly, if you look at the dynamics, some of the states have uh, income tax and most of the states have that. But there are few, such as Texas, Wyoming and all, they don't have income taxes and Nevada. So what happens is some of the companies have actually chosen to go there. They are business friendly. They have opened up and they have started receiving companies. Uh, Tesla's and everybody has come into uh, right. It doesn't mean that Texas do not have any problems, but they are more business friendly. And as a result, suddenly if the government is getting uh, 8,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 jobs, that's the, that's the angle which they want to go. Uh, and I think that is the one of the good things that has happened to this uh, old pandemic. And so coming back to that trust issue, I really don't think it is only the trust that is mattering at this time. People have actually forgotten the trust scenario. They are really bounced about, can I get a job? Can I get a, uh, or can I get into an entrepreneurship? Is there a funds available, investment available? How can I get to it? Uh, are there people who can take me to my, with my ideas forward? Uh, those kind of things are becoming more important. And I've been seeing that the cases are very much high there. The school systems are still lacking behind. Not everybody is online. They are offline. And uh, so the, we are seeing a lot of progress. But the dynamics of uh, Texas, as an example, suggest that receiving large business with open arms and yes, California is losing its heavily. And that is a great example which is being cited all across here uh, but to me i think the balancing act is highly critical especially because that you, russia ukraine war is going to be changing the entire dynamics as we have seen so far uh, it's not about trust anymore it's about the challenges that we're going to see forward so it's very early to say something at this time but in, within the next maybe two months or so we will start seeing the dynamics that is changing one caution here is that the balancing act is very highly critical and we expect the leaders to exercise a level of patience in their decision making, not to rush. And that is going to be the key. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Sean. Uh, that was very elaborate and I think you have raised a lot of good points. Uh, John, may I come to the last question for the day? How important are the CEO and senior leadership team uh, behaviors in rebuilding trust in institutions? And what are the benefits of high trust cultures in institutional life? How would you see it? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, the uh, the research, again, uh, would say that the biggest single factor in bu building a high trust institutional culture is the behavior of the, the leader and the senior leadership team. That, that role modeling and that leading by example uh, ripples out into a culture over a period of time. And, and we can see that politically. It's interesting on this discussion, you know, we, we can think of our political leaders, Jacinta Ardern, um, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, uh, Modi, you know, that, that we, we know that we live in a, a world now where these personalities are, are, are as important as the institution it's, itself. And so um, that's a measure of, uh, I think, where there's going to need to still be a lot of work uh, to help those leaders understand this dynamic of, of trust. Because I think, as Phil pointed out, it's, it's a lot of good intentions have been lost through um, uh, inappropriate behaviours that, that maybe leaders were not aware of in the moment, but, but they had a, a long-standing impact on trust levels in, in different institutions. So I think that is um, 
that is an important factor about the, the leadership role in, in rebuilding trust. Just remind me of the, the second question. What was the so, second question? Uh, what are the benefits of high trust cultures in institutional life? What are the benefits? Yeah, um, again, I, I, I don't want to bang on about research too much, but it is, you know, it is something that hopefully we, we can rely on. And if you look at the research in trust, I mean, the benefits of high trust cultures uh, are many and varied. I mean, there was a piece of research by uh, Dr. Paul Zak um, a couple of years ago in Harvard Business Review uh, called The Neuroscience of Trust, which showed a dramatic impact of high trust cultures around um, productivity, engagement, stress levels. Uh, mental health, you know, which are big topics at the moment in institutional life. But then there are equally studies that will show you the impact of, of trust on uh, profitability, on creativity and innovation. You know, trust really is a magic wand. It, you, you know, if you, if you put it at the heart of things, it will have many and varied benefits for, for all sorts of stakeholders. And, um, you know, as a, just as a final thought, interested in listening to to my colleagues today um i had this feeling that we are still in this um you know we, we're at the moment trying to sort of observe and, and reflect upon it but I, but i have this feeling that we're still in it and um and that this this disruption on a global stage is is going to continue um in this decade and this topic will therefore continue to be a very dynamic rapidly shifting conversation and i think it will need the best leadership sort of minds and uh, and behaviors to uh, to make sure we navigate uh, without you know some some dramatic downsides um so you know it's great that harassis is um sponsoring this debate you know and bringing bringing us together to talk about it and i suspect we'll need to continue to have that conversation for many months and, and years to come but it's it's great to be part of it today yeah <clears throat> thank you john and uh, uh, i think the issue is that putin has made us forget covid temporarily at least uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we moved on to other issues and uh, what i've been reading somewhere that for the next two three years we're going to see various similar type of situations coming up across the world i mean uh, that's not a doomsday prediction but uh, i think but this has taught us how to deal with it. And thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on leadership. Uh, whether it's political leadership or leaderships in corporate, I think they are similar. It's all personality driven and how the leader behaves. I would like to thank all my panel members for their various inputs. I think we got a very good ride from the US to India to UK to New Zealand. We got some good views of what's happening around the world. And I'm sure the audience will would have liked some of the thoughts which came across. Thank you very much for your time and for sharing your thoughts. Thanks, Richard. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for the team. Thank you. Bye-bye.